Hello, welcome to today's lecture on deep learning, which will be on differential calculus. Now, why do we need differential calculus? Well, in deep learning, we are optimizing functions. So the central goal is to fit a model such that it performs well in unseen data. Now in practice, we are only given a training data set and we use this to minimize a loss function. Yeah. Now, there are two main concerns around this. The first one is optimization. So we're fitting a model on this observed training data. And then we hope that, this, that we can take this model and generalize to unseen data. And there are some mathematical principles behind this. But largely in deep learning, this is guided by a sort of practitioner's wisdom and of course statistics. Now, today's lecture is about the optimization. So how can we use training data to fit a good model? And in order to do so, we do need to calculate derivatives. Tell us something basically how, what would happen if we would change a given model parameter just a tiny bit. Would how fast would our loss increase or decrease if we made an infinitesimally small adjustment to this given parameter? And if we know this for all our parameters, then we know how we can jointly adjust them to achieve um, a lower loss on our training data set. But first we need to compute them. Let's start uh, doing this with um, a function that takes a real number as an input and outputs a real number. So for example, the input in our case would be our parameter value and the output would be our loss. The derivative of f, that is what we're after, is defined as f prime of x equals the limit um, of the following function. So it's f of x plus a small variability minus f of x divided by the size of this uh, um, variability. So we're basically evaluating at x plus a tiny change and at x itself. Look at the difference and divide this by the size of this change h. And if we let this h go to zero in the limit, then if this limit exists, this is our derivative. So this is basically our rate of change. If this exists, we call f differentiable at this point a. And if it exists in, within a whole interval, so basically every single number within this interval, then we would call the function differentiable within the, this interval. And again, it's an, uh, the derivative f prime is an instantaneous rate of change with respect to our parameter x. Now, given our function y equals f of x, where y is the dependent variable, f is our function, and x is our independent variable, so the input is our independent variable, and the output, because it's basically moved um, by the independent variable via the function, it's dependent, um, then for this expression, the following things regarding the derivative are equivalent, well, we can call, either call it f prime of x, or we call it y prime, so the derivative of the dependent variable, dy over dx, df over dx, d over dx times f of x, or capital D f of x. Or if we want to make it explicit, that we're taking the derivative with respect to x, then we can also call this dx f of x. 
and both this d over dx and uh, capital D are um, our differential differentiation operators in this case. Now, in order to compute derivatives, um, we can use a number of functions that we then combine to compute the derivative of a more complicated function. So the first thing is that if we take the derivative of a constant c, that derivative is zero because it doesn't even depend on x. So if we change x, uh, nothing happens. The derivative of a power of x, so the nth power of x, equals to n times x to the n minus 1, uh, minus power minus 1. And that's the well-known power rule. Now note that actually n doesn't have to be a um, natural number, but can be any um, uh, real number. The derivative of the exponential function e to the x equals e to the x itself. And the derivative of the log is 1 over x. Now, say we um, given functions f and g that are differentiable, c is a constant in the following, then there's also the constant multiple rule. So the derivative of a constant times the function is the same as the constant times the derivative. The sum rule says something about the derivative of the sum of f on x, so the sum of two functions, which is equal to the derivative of f plus the derivative of uh, g. So the derivative of the sum is equal to the sum of the derivatives. And the product rule, so the uh, derivative of the product of two functions f and g equals f times the derivative of g plus g times the derivative of f. And finally, the quotient rule uh, says that the derivative of the quotient between f and g equals to g times the derivative of f minus f times the derivative of g divided by g squared. Now, basically these rules can be combined to take the, uh, um, to differentiate quite complicated function. Let's do a relatively simple example here. So we have the uh, given u equals f of x equals 3 times x squared minus 4x. So u is our dependent variable, f is the function, and x is the independent variable. And we want to compute the derivative of it. So f prime of x equals um, d f over d x and that equals to 6x. We're using the uh, power rule here and use the fact that this is a sum of two um, functions. So, so on the second one again use the power rule to arrive at minus 4. So that's the different um, the derivative of f. And now if we uh, say, okay, well, what is the, the tangent line at x equals 1? Well, then the first thing that we can do is we can evaluate um, both f of x at uh, f equals 1. So f of 1 equals 3 times 1 squared is 3 minus 4 times 1 equals minus 1. So um, and then um, we so this here is a minus 1 and Then we evaluate the derivative also at uh, at 1, which is 6 minus 4 equals 2. 
And this two tells us that the uh, slope of this line here is two. And if uh, we actually want to compute the formula of this line, then we can use uh, the first order Taylor expansion, which basically says that um, this equals to f of uh, one plus f prime of one times um, the point that we want to evaluate this at minus uh, one. And if we plug all of these things in, then we have here a minus one plus two times x, so this is really the slope of our Taylor expansion, and minus two equals to um, minus three plus two x. So this function here, let's call it f um, tilde of x equals minus three plus two x. So this here is a minus three and two is um, the slope. Now we have seen how to take uh, derivatives of univariate functions, of functions that take a single input and produce also a single output. Now how about multivariate functions, so functions that actually take n uh, values as input, so x1 through xn. And for those we actually call sort of the derivative with respect to a single one of these the partial derivative with respect to xi, where i is the index of the um, variate that we want to take the, um, the derivative with respect to. And that equals to uh, partial y over partial xi. So we introduce this um, symbol here. And that is basically given by the derivative of a new function that basically treats all the parameters except for xi as constant. So think about basically fixing all the x's uh, at their current value and doing this infinitesimally sm uh, small change by h only by at a single one. Yeah? And then it's the derivative of this function. So it's really the limit of h going to zero, f of x1 through x minus one fixed, xi plus this infinitesimally small change, and xi plus one through xn minus the uh, same thing, but keeping, uh, comparing it to um, f of xi, and dividing again by the size of this change. If we let that go to zero, then we get the partial derivative with respect to xi. And again, um, we can um, uh, denote this in, in several ways, for example, dy over dxi, or df over dxi, or um, f of uh, subscript xi, that is some form of shorthand notation, or f of i, even more shorthand or di of f, or dxi of f. Now, basically, if um, f is a function that takes an input in r to the n, so um, think of the, the multivariate uh, function before and taking those, those n x, um, xi's into a vector, so into a list, 
and using that as an input of f and uh, we still output an r then boldface x is the input vector x1 through xn and now the gradient uh, is defined as um, a vector that contains the partial derivatives with respect to all the individual um, xi's. And we write it with this um, triangle sign here, which is called nabla. And we make it clear that we're taking the gradient with respect to the vector x of f evaluated at the vector x. Um, or if the dependence um, on x is completely uh, unambiguous, then we would actually take just write this uh, nabla sign in order, so this triangle to denote the gradient with respect to x. Similar to these um, rules for computing derivatives of univariate functions, there are also a number of uh, useful rules to compute um, derivatives or gradients in this case of um, multivariate or vector valued uh, functions um, that can be combined in similar ways. So the first one would say that the gradient with respect to the vector x of a matrix vector multiplication, so A times x equals A transpose. And that holds for all matrices A element R, M, N. So we're basically the vector x equals x1 through xn, so it's an n-dimensional um, vector, and a uh, equals a11 through a um, mn. A N one A one um, sorry uh, this is an M here we have an um, N and so on and so forth. Now um, how does this actually come about? Well, we say that the gradient, the gradient x a x equal to the vector of all the partial derivatives. So of this um, over um, Now, if we actually look at what we're taking the partial derivative of, so let's compute one of those. Then, well, this is basically taking the partial derivative of the sum over i equals or j equals one through n a j times x j and partial x i. So where a j now is um, a single k 
column of A. So let me make it explicit that these are vectors and uh, those are scalars. Yeah? And now you basically see that if we take um, the partial derivative with respect to uh, xi, then uh, in the sum all the terms go away except for um, the, the ith uh, element in the sum and then using the um, um, power rule or the constant rule actually uh, would give us back the vector a i. So we can basically take the vector a i um, and plug it in there. Now uh, we have to be a little bit uh, careful because um, a i is a column vector however um, the gradient is uh, by convention now sort of um, a has has as in each uh, row basically the partial derivative with respect to um, xi so we actually have to take the transpose of this so this equals um, a a1 transpose through a n transpose equals a transpose. So this is how we get the matrix A here. So analogously, if we um, take the uh, gradient with respect to x uh, of x with respect to x of x transpose A, so basically the vector matrix multiplication of uh, correspondingly sized A, then instead of getting A transpose, we get A back. And of course now a, a has sort of um, flipped dimensionality com compared to before because we're multiplying it from the left with a length n vector. And um, if we combine these two, um, we basically have a function a squared form and similar to um, the squared, we basically get the um, a plus a transpose x as a gradient. And uh, if you want to take the gradient of the squared Euclidean norm, which equals to the gradient of x transpose x, then well, you basically get that by replacing a here by the identity matrix. So you get x plus x equals 2x. Yeah? So this is really analogous to the power rule for scalars. And similarly for matrices, so we don't just have to take, uh, we cannot only take gradients of vectors, but also with respect to whole matrices. And as we will see, even with respect to whole tensors of arbitrary dimensions, then these, uh, this gradient basically gives us, um, in this case, 2x. And note that basically the um, gradient of, of such a function that only returns a single value is um, equal to the uh, parameter matrix or tensor that we uh, compute the gradient of. Now, the tricky bit here is to, um, the tricks to get there are to compute the individual partial derivatives, right? And now put them in the, into a right order, into something that has the right shape. Yeah? And for that, uh, we sort of use a layout convention that for functions that only return a single value. If we take the uh, derivative with respect to a vector, 
So this gradient here of y with respect to, uh, to x, that is um, a column. If we take um, the, if we differentiate something that outputs a vector, so for example, a times x out, did output a vector, not a single value, um, with respect to a, a, a scalar, then we output a row vector. So this first dimension really is the dimension of, of x here, where here it's a scalar, so it's one dimensional, and here this is n dimensional, and the second one is the dimension of y, which here is one, and here it's m. And if we take the, if we differentiate a vector valued function with respect to a vector, then, so that was, uh, that is similar to the example of uh, differentiating ax with respect to x, then we get uh, something back that has the dimensionality of x as the number of rows, so that is n, and the dimensionality of y, the output as the number of columns, which is m. And finally, um, for something like uh, the Frobenius norm, where we um, output a scalar and input a matrix, and we take the gradient with respect to the matrix, then we get something back that um, has uh, the size of the matrix P, Q, um, yeah. And in case you want to learn more about this uh, or are unsure, um, the layout we use is the so-called uh, denom denominator layout. And here is the link to Wikipedia on matrix calculus, where if you uh, use control F and find denominator layout, you will find this layout convention that we're using here. So, um, Finally, um, say we have uh, two functions that um, sort of are chained together. So we say we have y equals f of u and u equals g of x. So it's a composite function and both of them are differentiable. Then we can use the well-known chain rule uh, to compute the derivative of that. Uh, and this will be uh, used all over in deep learning in order to compute um, gradients with respect to um, composite functions. So the derivative of y with respect to x, which is the input of g, equals the product of the derivative of y with um, uh, dy du times the derivative of u with respect to x. Or, yeah? And now, um, if u is a vector um, and x also is a vector, then we can um, compute partial derivatives with respect to the individual xi. Um, using this rule here. So dy dxi equals to uh, equals to dy equals uh, dy du1 times d1 dxi. Um, so you apply the chain rule to the first u and uh, so on and so forth. So with this I want to uh, summarize uh, this chapter on differential differential calculus. Um, so it's really central to deep learning, so that is why it's important that we are uh, reviewing it uh, and we'll also do some exercises on it. So uh, it can be applied to optimization problems in deep learning, which are really ubiquitous. And um, we 
reviewed derivatives, which are sort of rates of change uh, of a function, and they help us uh, to see okay what would happen if we changed our parameter, how would the function change. And they can be interpreted as a slope of a tang tangent line. And now the gradient is a vector for um, for a multivariate function. So it's a function that takes a vector as an input. Uh, and the gradient is the vector and the individual components of this vectors, uh, vector are the partial derivatives of uh, the function with respect to all the individual variables. And the chain rule enables us to differentiate a composite function. Um, and in deep learning, as soon as you have a deep neural network, then you have always composite functions because you're always sort of layering these functions and uh, into each other. And with this, um, I want to conclude this uh, lecture and review on differential calculus and see you next time for our first uh, lecture on an actual deep learning model, namely linear regression. So see you next time. Bye bye. Well, I said deep learning model. It's actually not that deep. However, we will see that it can be interpreted as a neural network, just a shallow one. So it's a shallow learning model. <laughs> see you. Bye bye.